August 19, 1942, Operation Jubilee sent 5,000 Canadian soldiers to raid the German-occupied coast of France. But more than 900 would die before the sleepy town of Pourville, beneath these white cliffs of Puy, and along the stony, exposed beach of Dieppe. Success depended on a weak enemy, but defenses were murderous. It was all over in nine hours. Now, 50 years later, a return to Dieppe. It is so peaceful now, so serene. But a half century ago, German guns on these cliffs were blazing down on Canadian soldiers below. The waters were choked with bodies, shattered tanks and landing craft lined these beaches. Good evening, I'm Brian Stewart. Of all the battles fought by Canadians in the Second World War, Dieppe continues to haunt us the most. So many unresolved feelings. Almost a thousand men died here, more than a thousand were wounded, and 2,000 were taken prisoner. Some historians say it was total disaster, a scandalously ill-prepared mission. Yet others say the lessons learned here and the raid's overall effect helped win the war. Later, we'll be joined by three veterans of Dieppe. One of them hasn't seen this battleground since the day he landed. The three will recall what happened here and also reflect on the legacy of the Dieppe raid. Home again are these Canadian heroes of the Dieppe raid. Sweethearts, mothers, wives and kiddies fairly ganging up for the first embrace. What a wonderful welcome awaits them. Right now, the world stops still on a railway station. Dieppe was an act of both military and political desperation. In 1942, Prime Minister Churchill needed an attack badly. The Russian allies, fighting desperately against German invasion, demanded that their Western partners relieve pressure by invading German-occupied France, opening a second front. The United States also pressed for an early invasion. But to the British, invasion seemed dangerously premature. Instead, Churchill hoped to ease pressure and appease these allies by staging a large-scale raid on a German-held French port. He gave the job to the flamboyant Lord Louis Mountbatten, cousin to the king, and the head of combined operations, which conducted commando raids on the Germans. The plan, as they rehearsed it on the Isle of Wight, was straightforward. Commando attacks on the right and left flanks of Dieppe, along with heavy air and sea bombardment of German defenses. The main attack, 5,000 strong, would hit the beach in front of Dieppe and sweep through the city, knocking out German targets before retreating in good order. It was to have been an all-British operation, but early on, Mumbatton made some political compromises. Canada wanted in. I suggested myself that the commanders and troops of the Royal Marine Division should be used for the whole operation. But the Canadian troops in the United Kingdom had been the champion of the bit, they hadn't seen any action since they came over, and so the army authorities decided to substitute the second Canadian division for the Royal Marines. And so the die was cast. British and even US commandos were used in flanking attacks on both sides of Dieppe, but the Canadians had the most dangerous role of all, to land right here on this exposed beach and then fight their way through the defended city. This frontal assault fell to the Essex Scottish and the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, supported by the Calgary tanks and a second wave, the Fusilier Montréal. The Royal Regiment of Canada with some black watch was part of the flanking attack on Puy, just east of Dieppe. And to the west, the South Saskatchewan Regiment and the Cameron Highlanders attacked Pourville. But almost everything went wrong. Intelligence had promised weak German defenses. Instead, they were strong, and also on a routine alert that night. And there was no massive air and sea covering bombardment. Cancelled for fear of causing French civilian casualties. 
Germans hit the Raiders with nightmarish fire. Artillery, mortars, machine guns, snipers. Many Canadians were killed in the boats. Those reaching shore were hit or pinned down by withering crossfire. Tanks lost their treads on the large stones of the beach or were blocked by the seawall and tank traps. By mid-morning, it was clear to the Canadian commander, General Roberts, that his men were being slaughtered. He ordered in landing craft to rescue survivors. But on all beaches, Dieppe, Puy, and Portville, hundreds more died as they tried to reach the boats. It was military catastrophe. Half the force had to be left behind as prisoners. The very essence of the Canadian 2nd Division wiped out in just nine hours. Of nearly 5,000 Canadians in the raid, 907 were killed, 2,400 captured. In all, 75% casualties. A half century later, the controversy continues. Lessons were learned at Dieppe that proved useful two years later in the Normandy invasion. But could such lessons be worth such a bloodbath? Historians and survivors of the raid continue to search for answers, often coming back to Dieppe, now once again a placid and modest resort city and fishing port, with little outward sign of the battle that so scarred Canadian history. Dominated by cliffs and headlands, Dieppe strikes a visitor immediately as an almost impossible place to attack by sea. And yet it was attacked by men who can never forget. In this program, we follow the return of three veterans who barely survived those terrible hours. Can you imagine sitting up here, yeah. looking down there at an attacking force and, and sort of grinning to yourself, saying, these guys don't have a, it's, a whisker of a chance. Which one will I shoot at first? Yeah, yeah. From former German positions, they're able to look down on the beaches and marvel again how anyone came through alive the nightmare of Dieppe. Archie Anderson had been a Western farm boy in the Depression 30s. He landed at Dieppe with a Calgary tanks, was taken prisoner. Anderson always feared returning. This is the first time he's seen the beach since that day. He remembers a deep foreboding before the raid. Uh, we had that foreboding before we ever left England. Uh, our driver, Bobby Cornelson, when we heard that we were definitely going to Dieppe and that the scheme was on again, he said, what do you think of it? And I said, we haven't got a chance. And I understand at that point or soon after, he wrapped up his uh, personal belongings and addressed them back to his sister back in Canada. So we knew we knew we didn't have a chance before we ever left England, and I think in their heart, most of them knew that. What did you feel like as you were coming in? Uh, a sign of almost, a feeling of almost sickening revulsion at the, at the carnage that was on the beach. There was another group of oh, nine or 10 up ahead of us, uh, uh, all of them wounded, I think, doing their best to help each other and themselves. And another shell landed in the middle of them, and they just vanished into thin air. They, we never saw any of them again. So it, it, it was a, it's hard to describe the, the feeling of fear and, uh, the, and the smell of burning flesh and, and the woolen garments was, stifling as well. Denny Whitaker had been a football star before becoming a captain with the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, is about to publish a new book on Dieppe. He also landed right on the main beach. Uh, the thing that struck me uh, most as we approached the, the beaches was that I expected that there'd be great damage. The buildings would be uh, knocked down, uh, uh, there would be a lot of uh, uh, damage to the general area of the beach. And um, much to my, ama my amazement, there was very little. 